Well, hello. How's everybody doing today? Awesome. Once again, my name is Adam Whitney, and I am a survivor of multiple hate crimes. Um, so I say survivor because victim tends to have negative connotation to it. So I say I'm a survivor because, damn it, I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you. And the reason why the hate crimes happened is because I'm gay. And if you didn't know, God bless your innocent heart. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so my earliest memory of a hate crime uh, was in the fifth grade. Now this is when I got my nickname, and it's a standing nickname, and that nickname is Faggot. So even saying that word kind of makes my stomach turn a little bit. But boy, it was used every single day. So one day I come to school and I'm walking down the hallway and I hear my nickname being shouted. And then at the front of the stairs, I felt a hand on my back and I was shoved face first down a flight of stairs. So it did go to court. And when we were in court, the judge said, well, maybe you need to start acting like a boy. I'm like, what the hell am I, Pinocchio? I'm a real boy. <laughs> and then he said, maybe you should talk in a lower tone. So I tried it. And then I was walking around school like I was John Wayne. I was like, how you doing? You OK? I'm OK. You OK? But that wasn't being my genuine self. That wasn't being who I actually was. My, my register is like B. Arthur on a good day, right? <laughs> so I kept everything locked in this little box. I never told anybody anything about what was happening to me because it was sort of like a shame thing. But I also didn't know what was happening to me because I didn't know who I was. So I just locked it away, threw away the key. So let's fast forward to middle school. <laughs> oh, middle school, right? So every single day I would walk in, I would either be spit on, hit, kicked, brutalized. My locker was written on, faggots must die. And later in my years, I actually became friends with the vice principal at that time. Um, and she imparted upon me, Adam, we did not know what to do with you. We didn't know how to help you because there were so many of them and there was only one of you. Kind of weird, right? <laughs> like I was the only gay in Carson City. <laughs> Very lonely. So let us fast forward a little bit to high school. Raise your hand if you liked high school. <laughs> Shut up, you're a liar. <laughs> so what? I was a cheerleader. <laughs> no. I'm not judging you, but I am. <laughs> so what happens at high school? Puberty, right? And what do kids going through puberty do to other kids going through puberty? They make fun of them for going through puberty. That's just the natural order of things. So one day I walk in after my, or it was during freshman year, I walk in and there's posters all around, drawings of me as a donut fairy. I didn't even know what the hell a donut fairy was. Right, but I guess it's just another term for a gay person. And I have to tell that person right now, whoever drew it, you should be in art school because it was a beautiful likeness. <laughs> so good job. <laughs> so I went and I ripped down all of the posters and went to the principal and I was told it's my fault. Stop being who you are. Yeah, right? That's almost like telling somebody of color, stop being that color. Stop being that race. <sighs> but no anger. <laughs> mm. So then uh, 
let's see, probably about sophomore year, I was sick one day, and I was getting sick a lot because I just kept locking everything away. I wouldn't tell my parents. I wouldn't tell my friends. I would come home and say, you know what? Today was a great day at school. I made a new friend. And by that, that meant I was beat up that day by a new person. So I was sick one day in sophomore year, and a teacher wrote up on the board, instead of calling Adam Whitney a faggot, call him Peaches. And I got my new nickname. So then something great happened to me. I found the theater. And I found my home. And I found these people that were talking to me like I was a human being and not just a sexual deviant. These people were treating me like I was an equal. They didn't beat me down. They built me up. And I, it was such a blessing. So, senior year, we did an all-state musical, a, a chorus line. And I got the beautiful part of Rachmelev Ben Yakubmeyer Beckenstein, <laughs> otherwise known as Gregory Gardner, very east side, I don't deny it, born 1943. I still know all of the choreography and all of my lines, and I'm for hire. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I was wanting really bad to get a beautiful costume, you know, something that just really stood out. And my friends and I said, let's go to Reno and let's go shopping. And it's like a big thing to go to Reno to go shopping. <laughs> so I was, uh, I borrowed a little sweater. It was an Argyle sweater. I will always remember this sweater. And it was really fit. And I was really fit because I'm dancing every day. Not like right now because I love cheeseburgers. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we get into the car and I'm in the passenger seat. And we're driving down the main street. And this car starts running us into the median. After the third time of him trying to run us off the road, I flipped him the bird like we all would do. <laughs> so then we get to the stoplight. And I will always remember this stoplight. It was the longest stoplight ever. So our car stops, and all of a sudden my door opens. I'm tied up with my seatbelt, and the person gets in the car with me and starts hitting me in the face. And it was so surreal because with every punch, my laughter grew. And then it started becoming like this weird duet where he would punch me, I would start laughing. He would punch me, I would start laughing. He would punch me, I would start laughing because I couldn't do anything because I was tied up with a seatbelt. So then he leaves the car and I could not stop laughing. Then I looked at my friends, and they were frozen, looking straight forward. They were frozen in time, frozen in fear and shock. And then my car door opened again, and he got back in, and he kept beating my face. When he finally was done, this was the first time that I looked down. And I tried to scream, but there was so much blood choking me that I couldn't get any words out. And when I looked down, all I saw was blood and bone. I finally turned, and I looked, and he was coming back. Well, something in me knew that I was not going to make it out of that car. So I begged my friend to run the red light because all traffic was stopped. Everybody was watching. People were out of their car watching what was happening. So they drove me to the hospital, and when the police arrived, I got told once again, it was my fault, because I flipped him the bird, and maybe I should stop being so gay. My mom finally asked, Adam, why did they do this? And I had to come out of the closet in the hospital. But my mom always told me to shine it on. Anytime somebody has hate and they're thrusting that upon you, to shine it on. I didn't understand what that meant. 
I didn't understand, so I just kept locking it away until it hit in that moment, in that hospital. And I realized shining it on meant that your light is so bright, don't let any one person dim it. And so to those kids out there that are being bullied, that are thinking that they have to end it themselves, I would like to say to them, take a moment, breathe, shine it on, because nobody should ever have the power to dim your light. Shine it on, please. And also, don't do what I did. Don't lock it away, because that makes it a Pandora's box. And when it opens, it's a scary, scary thing. So talk to someone. Talk to a loved one. Talk to a teacher. Talk to a principal. Talk to a counselor. But make sure you're talking. And also, make sure that you shine it on. Because this world should not be dimmed because of somebody else's hate. Your light is too important. So please, I beg of you, shine it on. Thank you.